got no name. Okay, my name is Joanne. Not having been to the shopping centre for quite some time, it's, it's a real challenge trying to find where everything that I want is because I hate shopping. I now um, have gained back a lot of trust and um, do have access to the money. 44.35. I'm about five months into my recovery, so um, yeah, I, I feel good about it now. Poker machines are evil things. <laughs> There's probably someone spent a lot of money in working out the, the tunes that they play on poker machines. There's got to be a subliminal message there to get you back again. You can leave one of those venues and you can still hear the music in your ear a long time afterwards. What you think is fun when you're doing it and then your day revolves around how quickly you can get back to them and then all of a sudden you look around and your finances are just shot. Well, I don't have a bank card or a hole-in-the-wall card anymore. They were the first two things I handed over to Tony very smartly. I have had constant uh, use of the cheque account, but at least Tony now very quickly and easily can see what monies are going where and maybe one day get back all those other bits and pieces. But right now, I don't want them. When he went to the pogies and stuff, so... You haven't got this thing going, have you? Yeah. Oh, God, you have to. This is a day in the life. Hey. This is a, your day in the life. A gambler's partner. <laughs> Ex. So what are you going to put down? Hey. A gambler's... Hey. Oh, we'll still there. You reckon they're going to be cool? Hey. That's too close. Get out. I've got nothing to do with this... Um, Yes, you have. You married a gambler. Well, you wasn't. When I married you, you weren't a gambler. You're like a magnet, though. That's it. Cut. That's <laughs> the end cut, of the scene, cut, is it? Cut. Yeah. Cut. Hello, my name is Michael C. I'm a compulsive gambler. I haven't had a bet today, and it's some 320 days since I had my last bet. I'm now in personal bankruptcy, but I'm due to the GA program. I found personal peace and peace with the world. Well, it was around about September last year that I. I was arrested by the police in a bank trying to pass false checks and they took me to this police station across the road and during questioning in the police station I, I really got fed up with my, my, myself and when the police left me alone in their interview room for some 15 minutes or so I took off my shoelaces and wound the first one around my neck and I remember I was he heaving for air and uh, gasping for air and I, I ran the second one around my neck and tied them both off and I was sort of going you know, breathing very, very heavily, trying to, trying to get air in my eyes. Uh, then I just took off my glasses and put my head down on, on, on the desk and really all I did was lie, lay down and qu quietly waited to die. Then I just went, went out uh, unconscious. Absolute despair. Absolute utter despair. Why couldn't I control myself? Why couldn't I bring my life under control? Why did I feel ugly? Why did I feel uh, ill at ease all the time? Which is partly depression, partly Parkinson's disease, partly the gambling. There were, there were other living issues. And the issue for me was in dealing with the expectations I had of myself as a, a husband, a father, the person who brought home the paycheck each fortnight. A man with Parkinson's disease can't live up to that image. It created me a feeling of low self-esteem, inability to cope. The gambling was the escape for me. It put a temporary damper on the pain of my life. For 42 years, I, I'm an accountant, I'm a computer expert, I, had a, I was nearly a millionaire, I owned my own house, I had a wife, I had a cat, a daughter, I had everything I ever wanted, I had a career, I, I was absolutely the, 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 the last sort of person you'd expect to be out of control, just during this period of depression and then getting compulsive gambling that, that took over. There's no, there's no way that I, I, would, I would behave like that in, in, in normal circumstances, that's why compulsive gambling is numerous. Every time I've been gambling seriously, I've always ended up in a suicide attempt. With some sort of distress in my life, the, the, the depression would take over. Then I'd go gambling, and the gambling would, would, would destroy some part of my life. And then I'd, then I'd try killing myself, back into a psychiatric hospital, out of psychiatric hospital. Something else would happen. I'd start gambling again, try to kill myself. It was just a circle. But I mean, what, what use was I, was I to my daughter if I was going to gamble everything away? So. In a sense, I was getting rid of myself to make it make way for her. 
Well, same way. Your gambling is a fact of life. I, I don't condemn anybody who gambles. You've got to have a limit to what you can do. Live within your means. You know, if you, if you say you make 600 bucks a week, you can't gamble 700 of it, can you? If you haven't got it. There's people who are doing that. Gambling what they haven't got. Because they can go and get money on bank card, credit cards. It's ridiculous, isn't it? He doesn't understand the word compulsion. And he also doesn't really believe it's a sickness. Um, if you haven't got a compulsive nature, how the hell can you understand it? I come from New South Wales. That's been up there for years. And I had mates when I used to go to school. Their parents used to drink and gamble, and they never had food on the table. The, these things, that, they affect you when you're young, so you, they're in your mind. You, you're throwing money. You must go outside and, and throw 100 bucks up in the air. Maybe if Tony comes and sees the documentary and really sees and listens to what is said and also not just from me perhaps from other gamblers as well um, or maybe he might have a little bit more insight into it I don't know. I kept asking her for bank statements she never had them couldn't find them couldn't find a checkbook couldn't find the bank book. They were hidden where everywhere absolutely everywhere I mean they were in my makeup case. Some of my bank statements smell like wild roses. I hope the account depreciates it. You know, what's going on? I said, you're gambling again. You're going to the pokies. No, I'm not. Then they start more arguments. No. I can understand his resentment and where it's coming from. I find <clears throat> more often than not I can put myself in his place, but I don't think he can do the reverse. It's going to be in the back of your mind although you die. No. It's something that shouldn't have happened, but it happened. Mm. And when they say shit happens. Just recently, um, Tony come home. He took some money out of his wallet and uh, he had a three-figured amount in there, which I really didn't think he needed in his wallet. And I just sort of said, well, look, you know, you're an idiot carrying that much money with you. Why don't you put it somewhere? On the Tuesday night, he came home and said he'd lost his wallet with all that money in it. And it was getting close to a four-figured amount. And so much did I want to say, I told you so, and all those horrible things that first come to, th come to your mind. And a couple of days later, when he had uh, calmed down a little and the subject could be discussed, and I just, I said to him, I said, well, you know, Tony, it was so hard for me not to say something, but I also felt I put myself in your place. You felt rotten as it was. You didn't need someone adding to that. And I said, so, you know, sometimes, please just think before you say some of the resentful things that you do to me. It's probably negative thoughts in your mind, you know, you just get pissed off. But I, you know, I've got three kids, so you just can't leave them. They didn't ask to be born, did they? You, you've got to be a parent. I'm not proud of what I did either, but I don't need it constantly thrown up in your face either. It seems the worst of it, of that's over now. Though. Well, I hope it is anyway. Is it? Almost no more to come, is there? God, I hope. We said this six years ago, didn't you? You know, that's bullshit. Yeah, but I didn't go and get no, yeah, I know, but I said to you, don't go. And you weren't going, as far as I knew. In poor old Tony, he was walking around at times with his, his chin on his kneecap and uh, feeling very sorry for himself. I used to wake up now at 3 o'clock every morning because I got in the habit of waking up. I couldn't sleep. Worrying about it? No, well, it just plays on your mind. Mm. He had the right to be sorry as well. I've done a terrible thing to him. And uh, I just sort of said, look, you know, it's not fair. You have to pull yourself up and, and get moving. I said, because you can't drag everybody in the house down. I've got to find 2,000 a month in, in, before we eat. And that's uh, two loans and superannuation. And that's where you pay, you pay gas, electricity, then the phone. 
Tony's still there, so that means that there's a damn good chance we can work our way through all this and come out the other side better people, both of us. The highlight of our week is easy, the arrival of Sarah. Uh, that mum and little Sarah, our grand You make us pancakes, Ed. Make us happy. <laughs> So, how old was Sarah when uh, Michael became oh, sick? Yeah. Two months. She's been when Michael gets sick. Her mother worked and he's looking after the Sarah. Until two, what, two years, got to be in the January. Then separated. Sarah gone with her mother, Michael coming with us. That's the story. After Michael became sick, then he had the, the difficulty with, with the gambling, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, mm. he was just seeking to do, do everything. Tommy just came. Hmm. So it was more or less the same yeah. time. Maybe that. He don't like it, but he can't help it. When Michael gets sick, Michael doesn't tell me anything because mum gets upset. Mum look in everything. Mum know everything. The house normal got to be painted every four years. Now about five years time we never painted nothing. It's his sister looking after us. Mom after him. Nobody else I get. I got two sisters, one in America, one back home. That's all. Sarah came on Friday. She said, can I stay another four weeks, please? Business coming like that is always problem for the children. Because for the biggest people, I don't care. But the children suffer all the time. Nobody can stop him. Nobody can say something to him. I try everything to help him, but I can't help him when they stop him going that, uh, in the meeting, what I called it. And Gamblers Anonymous. Yeah. yeah. It's better. From that time, it's very much better. I mean, there's the human side of this, which yeah. is, they go through an awful lot of agony through this period. Yeah. I sat up and waited outside in the queues for a little while, waited for them to open up so as I could go in and get my piece of hose. I thought, well, I must drive and, and find a quiet spot. I don't want anyone to find me. I found myself sort of wandering back um, up through Hastings, Frankston and all those areas. We're starting to get quite late by that stage. And so I just pulled off into a road that said no through road. And I thought, well, I'll just keep going until I can't see another house. And I did, I ended up right in a, the back part of the bush. I then placed the hose in and got back in the car and sat quietly and drank these cans of beer. I'm obviously breathing in the carbon monoxide by this time and just sort of getting ready to curl up. There was a voice I heard that said, this is not the way you do it. And it was the voice of uh, my local doctor who many years ago when I had postnatal depression and I went to him and it was then that he said, well, you're too strong, you won't let that happen. And it was his voice that I heard. I opened the car door and smelt the fresh air. And then I was in two minds again. I thought, can I shut the door again and start the car up? The logical brain had, had started to take over and said, you know, that's far enough. Now take the hose out, which I did, chucked it in the back of the car. And so I uh, drove home. Did you really want me to walk back into that spot? I really don't think I could do it. It's 
brought up some very strange feelings and emotions just um, talking about it and I'm not really sure whether I could go back. Personally, I think this is far enough. <laughs> Everything is just sitting so close to the surface. And I don't really like those feelings that <clears throat> I don't like the feelings I had then and I certainly don't like them now. But for those that are walking down that track now who feel that the only way out is suicide, don't do it. It's not worth it. You, you leave bigger holes behind you than what you think you're getting out of. It, it's not worth it. I have gone five months now where it would have been five months of horrible guilt and anger and, and hard times for my family had I have been successful. I think perhaps also coming back here today, uh, maybe it isn't so bad. I mean, there is uh, lots of feelings, as I said before, but perhaps if we can turn them around and just make it so as someone else doesn't try and do what I did. Uh, if just one person doesn't do it, well then, having reenacted all this and gone to all this trouble and brought all these emotions up, it'll be well worth it. I actually went to that meeting today because I, I wanted to talk about something that I had on my mind, which was my, my impatience about my own um, state of recovery from Parkinson's disease and from the operation I had. This made me feel better. I remember very vividly my first meeting standing up that particular night admitting admitting I was a compulsive gambler to a room full of strangers was the first time I'd ever admitted to anyone else. I think the rest was just tears and, and either that or very indistinguishable. I sat down, um, took in the rest of the meeting and went home feeling, I suppose, somewhat relieved. Group therapy sharing, that's, that's in essence what GA is. Anyway, if there's been a new woman a uh, female that's come on the scene and is very distraught or upset or anything, well, I tend to sort of go and comfort them. Hey, you know, only a few months ago, you know, that was me, where you are now. There was people there who came in week out, week in and week out and said very little and listened to me pour out my, my tale of woes. It's up to me to, to, to uh, listen to other people, and give them the, the forum in which they can, they can build their own recoveries. Well, here we are. This is where um, we have our fellowship meeting, or my fellowship meeting. Um, I come down here once a week because I find that I really need it. It's helping in my recovery. Sometimes we have 45, 50 people come to our meeting. You can't really put it into words, just what the compulsion is. If, if you could say that you left your big toe on your left foot starts itching and then you know you've got your compulsive habit. But it's not like that. And for a lot of us, um, you never ever know why. I really don't know. I perhaps further along in my recovery may be able to really look back and look really deeply and find a reason for it. But that's not going to stop my compulsion anyway. And I am a compulsive gambler. I will always be a compulsive gambler, but at this stage I feel I'm a compulsive gambler that chooses not to gamble. I need it at least once a week. If I don't come once a week, it's, it feels as if you've committed a sin. <laughs> it just doesn't feel right and it doesn't sit right until you come again home. Very thankful for the fellowship that I get from here and just the help and the support and constantly, as I've said, no judgment. You don't want judgment. I don't want judgment, not yet. I'll have to judge myself, um, but I don't want anyone else to judge me, not yet.